Okay. Let me come over here. Slideshow. Okay, so uh, again, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm gonna kind of go through this in a couple sections. And please, anytime along the way, uh, if you wanna ask questions, uh, go for it. And I think there's gonna be plenty of time uh, at the end as well. But like I said, I, I'm happy to answer questions all along the way. Uh, I wanna start by kind of talking about what the motivation of this was and kind of why and how this mission started. Uh, then I'm gonna go into uh, discussing this new infrastructure we refer to as an edge cloud. Uh, I'm gonna take you through that. I think some of you have obviously a uh, technology IT background. Uh, and we won't go very deep, but I think I'll help you understand the overall architecture, uh, which is in support of developing a new class of applications we call edge cloud applications. Uh, to not make it too abstract, I'm gonna take you through three examples, different types of applications. One that is, uh, in essence, a production application can be used in the clinical setting, a application which uh, could be used by clinical engineering, uh, supply chain, et cetera, in production. And then, and some of you earlier today heard the example, which is a, a Stanford research project referred to as EchoNet Peds. And I'm gonna talk you through that as well as a pioneering new way of developing um, AI and healthcare applications. So um, with that, uh, I kind of did my introduction. Uh, you know, I've had this uh, life of being on the one side in the academic world and on the other side in the commercial world. I actually wrote this book called The End of Software that kind of predicted the rise of companies like Salesforce and NetSuite, et cetera. And as I said, the, this class became the reason how I met Anthony. And because of Anthony, I started learning things that you guys know, but I was completely surprised by. Um, so this actually is a story that happened just last year. A little kid went undiagnosed with brain cancer because people are still using CD-ROMs to pass data around. Although I hear some people are starting to use USB sticks. So living in the technology world, I'm like, oh, you gotta be kidding me, right? So that's kind of, we'll call it simple technology, uh, all the way to, and many of you on this call have been working in the world of AI, uh, AI, which is you know starting to transform our consumer lives, uh, particularly in the imaging area is, uh, you know, has much promise in the world of medicine, but I think this is just screenshots of presentations that were was done at Texas Children's um, last or two years ago. It's kind of a litany of the same thing. Uh, we don't have enough data. We don't have enough data. And as you all know, who are in this area, you can't build these neural net algorithms without access to plenty of data. As a result, and you might guess, I'm connected to the Stanford AI and Medicine Program. This is a conference they ran. Um, many of the algorithms that have been developed in general are fairly brittle because they have only been trained on very small data sets. So as a person coming from the world of computing, I kind of said, well, this is really a challenge for the infrastructure we don't seem to have the infrastructure in place to crack through the very simple problems of sharing data, as well as the challenges that clearly are part of the whole world of AI in medicine. Um, some of you may be aware of this report that just got issued fairly recently by the EU. They make only one technical recommendation, which is you need to enable, as you see, access uh, to healthcare data. Now, when I look at this problem, I think, you know, the healthcare data, where is it? It's not, I know this can be a somewhat controversial, it's not in the EMR. I look at the EMR and think it's just a giant billing system is all it is. There, the data is not really there, right? Um, just trivial example, the uh, Echo Lab at Stanford pushes out 50 gig per day 
you know, that's not going into EMRs. There's a ton of digital exhaust out there. The data is coming out of the machines. And we said, oh, there's probably, probably a million healthcare machines out there. Why do I say that in pediatric medicine? Uh, we did a back of the envelope with Children's of Orange County, who has, I'll say, between two and 4,000 uh, healthcare machines. Uh, Packard has 10,000. I'm sure you guys are on the high end of this. But if we were to use an average number, we used an average number of 2,000 healthcare machines. What do I mean by that? Uh, ultrasounds, uh, uh, drug infusion pumps, blood analyzers, gene sequencers, et cetera. Uh, and there are about 500 children's hospitals in the world. So hence the number a million, right? I'm gonna make another maybe controversial comment to you. I don't, this whole idea of trying to aggregate data in central repositories, I'm gonna tell you, I think it's a dumb idea. I, I know people are working on this. You know, I've talk, talked to the guys at NIH um, in, in this area, but I'll tell you there's two fundamental issues with central repositories. Number one is a technical challenge, and this is born of years of experience in enterprise software. As soon as you gather data, you're implicitly thinking about an application of that data. As soon as you do that, you organize a schema. As soon as you organize a schema, you in effect lock out the second application. And I'll say from the world of enterprise software, we've seen this happen over and over again. Number two problem of this is it flies in the face of fundamental issues of privacy management. One of our core team members, actually a former student with 14 years of experience in privacy, and we very much architected this thing around security and privacy. I'll tell you that there are two fundamental pr principles in privacy. Number one is purpose limitation. Number two is storage minimization. When you say I'm gonna gather a whole bunch of data you go, well, what are you going to use it for? Well, if you don't have an answer to that, that's not purpose limitation. And it certainly is not storage minimization. So we took a step back and said, we need a new infrastructure. You're not going to build the future of healthcare on top of EMR systems. So you're going to have to have an infrastructure that standardizes the data from all the healthcare machines globally, number one enable, and I'll show you what I mean by this, application-specific data access. So not an idea that says, oh, I'm just going to keep all this stuff for some purpose in the future. No, for an application, a specific application. Learn while preserving privacy. I'll comment on federated learning. Some of you are already deep into this, but learning by preserving privacy is core. But I think the other thing thing which we now have the capacity to do is start to learn continuously as opposed to kind of the world we're coming from, which is a batch learning model. And finally, build an infrastructure where you can actually deploy the results of all this to the point of care. So we set ourselves a mission. Our mission is, we call it a moonshot mission, is to enable a new generation of applications based on access to all thousand healthcare, the data from all thousand healthcare machines and all 500 children's hospitals in the world. So that's been our mission statement. It's what's organized the team and the group that is now working in this area. So how are we gonna do this? So this part, I'm gonna talk about infrastructure. We, are, we have developed a new infrastructure we call an edge cloud. Why do I call it an edge cloud? Well, if you took my class on the very first day, my cloud computing class, I go, well, what is Amazon's AWS, Google's cloud, Microsoft's Azure? What is that? Well, it's, and I'll pick on Amazon. Amazon buys a lot of computers. They manage the performance, availability, and security of those computers. They deliver them in an OpEx model and they put those computers in about 10 data centers in the world. That fundamentally is Google Cloud, that's fundamentally Azure as well, and obviously I'm focusing on the compute and storage elements. So what are we doing? It's very similar. We're acquiring a bunch of computers. We're gonna manage the performance, availability, and security of those computers. 
We're going to deliver them in an OPEX model. The only big difference is we're going to put them in 10,000 data centers, right? Or in our case here that we're discussing 500, meaning every children's hospital in the world. But this is architected. We've actually already begun conversations with lots of other applications of this idea, but it's been architected to, in essence, be placed into any building in the world. So if we zoom in to this edge cloud, what will you see? So the first step is we need to establish what we refer to as an edge zone. We can go into far more detail here. This is an act actuality. What we're asking for when we say, would you like to be a Vanguard hospital is, do you want to implement an edge zone? The edge zone is basically a secure method, largely uh, managed by thinking about how the network configuration works that allows for multiple edge servers to exist in the building. Just so you can understand it a little bit, the zone at some level is a one-to-one -one relationship with a building, but it's not 100% that. Just to give you an example, we deployed an edge zone at the Children's Hospital, you may know, uh, in the Vatican. It's actually five buildings, but it's only one edge zone. So the edge zone is really a logical idea, which in essence serves as the model for protection for the compute storage and network. Inside the edge zone are edge servers. These edge servers have a particular kind of application on them. There is a one-to-one -one relationship between the edge server and the machine. Uh, these, these applications we refer to as digital twins. They in essence replicate the data in the machine. So these applications that replicate the data, they present that data inside what we call edge data services. So what kind of data am I talking about? Fundamentally, four different kinds of data. Number one, static information. What's the serial number of the machine? Number two, what's the environmental information? Uh, where's the machine located? Three is dynamic data. So that's like, well, what was the last error code? Uh, what's the laser power level on the gene sequencer? And then the last is what we call the nomic data. Uh, so the actual echo or the blood analysis or the gene sequence. So in essence, a, a digital twin is built for a machine class, we'll call it that. And by virtue of doing that, all the data in the machine is replicated into edge data services on that particular edge server. This is made available through the data is made available. I'll, the next slide's really busy. So I'll just stay right here. The data is made available through edge data services in a controlled and managed way. So let me just go through this really quickly. Let's make Kathy the owner of the Philips ultrasound on the third floor. Okay, so Kathy has two choices. Number one, she gets to decide, do I share any data, right? Do I share any environmental data, any dynamic data, any gnomic data from this machine? That's the first layer. The second layer is with which application? So I could choose to share the environmental data with the Jessily application, uh, but not the nomic data. And I could share with the Tim application, the nomic data, but not the environmental. So this should be very familiar to you because it's fundamentally how you do that on your phones today. You can say, you know, uh, Twitter can see my location, but not my photos and Facebook can see my photos, but not my location. These are just two of 39 different security features. There's an hour long talk to go through how we manage security because it sits at the core of how this whole system works. So the two, these are two of the, uh, of the 39 different um, security management features. And you, can, uh, I, can I quick oh, go do, on. You, do, you, do you capture patient identifiers as part of that or, or yeah. this is just? If the data is available in the machine, the data is now in the edge server. So in a DICOM image, just to use as an example, it could be buried in the image itself, as you well know. It could be buried in the DICOM headers, in the metadata, et cetera. So 
if the machine, if the, if the ultrasound has the data, we have the data. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So as I said, the data is presented through Edge Data Services to authorized Edge Cloud applications. Those applications could be in cardiology, we're actually working right now in scoliosis or orthopedics, uh, or as we will show you in a little bit, uh, to the clinical engineer or the biomedical engineer. Um, all of these applications are developed with what we call Bevel Cloud Studio. And if you guys are interested, we can give you access to Studio. Studio contains all the APIs, right? Uh, quick start guides, et cetera. Uh, and every application I'm gonna show you going forward was developed using Studio. Uh, in our minds, I'm gonna show you three applications. There are 3000 applications of this architecture. So I'll just stop there for a second before going to applications and answer any infrastructure questions you might have about how the edge cloud works before we go in. Also, Kim, I do think Peter Lawson was able to join. So Peter, I don't know if you want to just um, introduce yourself to Tim. Oh, hi. Sorry, I was running late. Tim Peter Lawson, I'm EVP of Health Affairs, longtime friend and uh, collaborator with Anthony as well. So thank cool. you for the presentation. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Peter. Any, any specific networking uh, requirements in, in terms of performance or, or the scales up and storage requirements as well? Well, the storage, um, so the edge servers themselves are the storage. So just to give you, you know, to go to numbers right now, the small instance of these have 32 gig per edge server, uh, but we can also build or deploy large instances that have more than that. Um, from a networking perspective, uh, the edge servers have the capacity to connect uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and cellular. We've actually done a test at Stanford uh, with Ericsson uh, to see whether or not a private 5G network could support a backplane for, in essence, this um, edge cloud. And I can share the results of it. It worked remarkably well. And we were thinking it was a great test vehicle because we actually put the, the array of antennas outside the building and uh, that children's hospital was built to California earthquake code. So it has a ton of rebar. So we felt like if it could work there, it could work anywhere. In the uh, early instantiations of this, we are actually, because we are talking to the ultrasound machine in the building, we have to cohabitate in a secure way with the, uh, with, the, with the network of the hospital. And we actually have a prescribed way of doing this that we sit down and walk through network engineering. Uh, it both has to do with port control as well as how the VLANs are, are managed. So we have to leverage the internal network. So does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Kim, could, could you, Tell us a bit about the ontologies and uh, and uh, data representation uh, standards that you use. Um, yeah, that that's a good question. In essence, what's going on here? I'll go back to this slide. Here is um, the data is standardized by virtue of what the digital twin does. So. The digital twins job is to standardize that data so that in essence, and we'll use the example of a Phillips ultrasound, once that digital twin is built, then I don't care where that Phillips ultrasound exists, whether it's in Kenya or in the UK or in Boston, the data presented to edge data services is identical. So in the case of Phillips, just to use the example, all that is, is it's whatever the DICOM, if you're talking about the gnomic data, it's the DICOM image, right? The DICOM image that was headed for the PAC system is the same DICOM image that is available through edge data services. In the case of dynamic data, it's actually what Phillips calls a syslog, which is obviously unique to Phillips, but it is also presented as, gnomic, as dynamic data inside edge data services. 
So for any machine class, and we just experimented that Philips one with a Philips Lumify, which is, as some of you know, a handheld ultrasound. And actually the application worked just fine uh, for that class of machine. So within a class of machines, it standardizes the data. Now I'll pick on Beckman just to use that as an example. So we would standardize the data coming out of the Beckman blood analyzer, but just to make up an example, as you know, the Siemens blood analyzer, the way the blood analysis is represented is obviously not identical to what is true in the Beckman one. So in our world, we go, that's an application level question to answer. The data presented in the Beckman uh, digital twin is standard across all Beckman machines in the world, uh, the Siemens across all Siemens machines in the world. And then we leave it to the applications if they need to rationalize it beyond that. Does that make sense? And the, of the 3,000 applications, can you give a flavor of, of uh, the range of functionality and also who, who developed 3,000 applications? No, no, no. I said we believe there could be 3,000 applications. Okay. I'm going to show you three. <laughs> OK. Right. But, we, but, but Tim, we could develop any app we wanted. I want you guys to develop apps. <laughs> uh, yeah, Even it's more. sort of like the way apps got developed on phones and iPads it, and things. It, it, it is, the analog is very much there, very much the same. We're trying to standardize the way in which an application can be built and how data is presented to it, and then encouraging the community to go build applications. And Absolutely, it, Kathy, right. And I think there's gonna be broad agreement that, um, we're not going to build all our analytics and applications in in native electronic health record software, but does electronic health record data enter into Edge Cloud? It can, depending on what the app, the Edge Cloud application wants to do, is the answer to your question. The Edge Cloud applications can be local only, meaning running only on the, and I'll give you an example of that. I mean, here's an example. We actually did this just to show you the power of this. We actually built a voice recognition application so you could talk to the machine. So it's resident just at the edge, doesn't talk to anything else. And, and you will see this in other examples, the edge cloud application can talk to public or private clouds. You know, it can talk to Azure, AWS, uh, you know, your own instance sitting on your own servers. So the question of does an edge cloud integrate with an EHR, it's, it's up to the application to make that decision. Does that make sense? Uh, well, uh, I'll, let, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make sense of it as we, as we see. Okay, that. okay, okay. Tim, Tim is, is the idea that the majority of the computations would happen within the edge or it would go Kind of, kind of on a global scale between the edge sites. So is this just application delivery and then we compute or your, your vision is to put everything together? No, I, th I think it's going to be as uh, all things. There's some things that are gonna make sense to run at the edge and some will make sense to run in what we call the center cloud. And it's really gonna be application specific. Uh, maybe as I show you, examples, you'll see that. I mean, you know, I'm going to talk about federated learning. That's a great example of we think the federated learning will occur at the edge on the edge server itself. Now, the aggregation of the model parameters might occur in a private cloud at Boston, or it might occur at AWS. Uh, we also, although this gets really kind of interesting, we also have the capability to do what we call inter and intra zone communications, but we're now getting a little bit sophisticated. So I think that the answer of what runs locally and one, what runs uh, in the center cloud is going to be application specific. But Tim, um, so just to summarize, right? So you're giving us double cloud allows us the infrastructure to create these digital twins from this edge devices or technology, ultrasound machines, whatever, blood labs. And then the data resides within our zone and the 
what you've discussed so far is setting up a bevel cloud zone on which applications, which you'll show us, can yeah. be built and deployed yeah. on the edge. It, yeah. Is that where we are? Yeah, let yeah. me just, a little nuance. So today we are building the digital twins. We, we, are, we are thinking through how it is we let other people build them. But for now, we're building the digital twins and doing it. So really the question becomes what edge cloud applications who can use the data, the imaging data, obviously, or the blood analysis data, so. The, the data are gonna be in a format specific to the individual machine. To the machine, yeah. So, yeah. So, if, so we would be able to do federated learning, for example, with other hospitals that are using the exact same machine. Yeah, exactly. Same, same model, yes. same yes. year. Right. Yes. Okay, well, so. uh, I think can to say it the same machine class is probably the right way to say it. So, depending on the yes. variability though between the yeah in the data yeah. models, right? Yeah. Or or some of that would get worked out to bring it together at the application stage. You would build an application that would allow you to look at both data sets, even if there was some slight difference is how I understand. Yes, it. that's that's also doable in this because mm -hmm. the edge cloud applications can transmit data with permissions. I mean, this gets in the networking side, but with permissions to anywhere, so. But the applications can be vendor neutral. Like the absolutely are. Mm -hmm. And so we, yeah. I mean, that's what, gets into the application phase, you're doing the infrastructure that allows it the deployment of these applications yes. at the edge yes. to do the federated learning that you'll discuss. Yes. yes. Okay. So let me do this because we've been talking about applications. Let me give you uh, three examples of edge cloud applications. Uh, I'm going to talk you through a uh, clinical production application by a company called Teleray, a clinical engineering application that could be used in production by a company called Umnitsa. And then I'm gonna talk about the EchoNet PEDS project, which I classify as a clinical research application. And some of you heard more detail about that this morning. So uh, I'm gonna start with Teleray. So Teleray, amusingly enough, is a company that was founded by the guys that built the software to burn CD-ROMs. <laughs> so they, they have moved into the future to enable image exchange to occur using computers and not CD-ROMs. So fundamentally, a Teleray at Edge application can be deployed within the Edge zone connected to any imaging machines. And now you can do image exchange across all the zones whether, well, I, I wrote within a zone, so you may wanna do it within a zone. You can do it obviously across zones uh, with any imaging machine. So this is image exchange, long-term image archival, the ability to view applications from multiple, uh, view images from multiple devices. It's the Teleray application. So Teleray, just do this even more detailed, the Teleray Edge Cloud application, if given permissions, again, can access the data at the edge, it will then take the last image coming off that MRI scanner and transmit it to the Teleray uh, Center Cloud application, which actually is running at Azure. Okay, so very simple, what I think of as collaborative type of application uh, is available. We actually have been in testing with Teleray uh, as we speak. Um, let me give you another example, which is not uh, clinical, but over in the world of uh, supply chain, clinical engineering, production IT. Um, this is a company called uh, Umnitsa. Uh, they have been tackling the problem of helping the CIO manage IT things, endpoints, cell phones, uh, laptops, et cetera, 
applications, cloud-based applications, infrastructure, as well as networking and managing the complete life cycle of doing that from purchasing all the way to end of life. Um, this is an application designed to go do that. They actually have customers that, you know, you guys have heard of like Peloton, Carvana, Apple, et cetera. I've known the founders for a lot of years and we said, well, it's interesting. As soon as we are connected to the healthcare machine, we can now provide a lot of this type of capability to the healthcare infrastructure. Uh, remember I said, we not only get the nomic data, but we also get the last error logs, the location of it, what's the serial number of the machine by virtue of the Omnitsa Edge Cloud application running. So you can now apply the same techniques that you could apply to your IT infrastructure, to your healthcare uh, machine infrastructure. So just give you a couple examples of what you might do with it. So security, as we all know, is a big deal. Well, actually, because of the data that we have here, we can actually tell you, oh, what was the last security patch that was available for that class of machine? Because we're totally connected to it and connected to, to the information. Um, we can optimize and I say, I think completely change how customer service works in the connected world. So not only can we have, we can see, right, the last error log that got thrown by the Phillips machine, but actually de-identified the last image. And because of the nature of the application, you could actually share this with the Phillips engineer or whatever. So you could do debugging uh, problems much, much faster in the connected state using this kind of application. And the last is, because we have the data, I mean, we, we know where the machines are, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about, but we also know how much they've been utilized. So for people that are sitting down going, well, what is the utilization of these machines? Do we need more machines? Do we need fewer machines? There's an entire workflow engine that is running that could help in managing uh, the, uh, the financial aspects of owning these, uh, I'll say millions of dollars worth of assets. So that's just to give you another flavor of the kind of applications that are possible. And then finally, let's use the clinical research example, Echonet Peds. This is a project we started up with my friends at Stanford. Uh, we talked about this earlier, you know, it's hard to get data, hard to get data. And I said, you know, we really don't think trying to go build central repository is the right answer. So instead, Echonet Peds and others, we're actually doing this in orthopedics as well. We're pushing an entirely new way to develop, deploy, test, and improve AI and healthcare applications. And it's really a three-step process. Number one is let's start because you can start with centrally trained algorithms that are likely trained on very small data sets. I will use scoliosis because we've been deep in the middle of it. There are nine teams in the world right now who've developed, I'll call it rudimentary, small data, centrally trained neural network algorithms out there. So in this model of the world, let's start with one of those. And I'm guessing at Boston Children's, you guys have done work in, in other areas where you've developed centrally trained algorithms, which were likely trained on very small data sets. So that's step one. Step two is let's push, push the application into the field. So because as you've already seen here, if this application has been developed and runs for Philips and Siemens ultrasounds, we now can put that application all across the world at every edge zone and now test the accuracy of these algorithms, right, deployed, as I said, anywhere in the world, which then allows, you can go, well, hey, it's working really well, good, that's wonderful, or how do I improve the accuracy? Again, this infrastructure, because it's architect this way, allows for federated learning to occur at the edge, so no, none of the data needs to move. The only thing that's moving is model parameters, 
which both preserves privacy as well as you might guess, preserves network bandwidth as well. So we think this is a, a really pioneering way of going about the challenge of how to develop it. So in the case of Echonet Peds, uh, Charitha and team have started with a small data set, developed an algorithm based on that data set. If you'd like to know more, uh, you know, we can go deeper or uh, I know uh, Ming and Chesley might've been the meeting. They probably can give you more detail out of this, but it was trained on a small data set. The next step of this is we're gonna deploy this to all the edge zones. Um, we actually right now are targeting having 32 edge zones in all six continents uh, by the end of this year. We already have four operational right now. Uh, we're just scheduling three of them, one in the UK, one in Delaware, one in uh, the West Coast, and then one in Kenya. So deploy this algorithm into the field to test its accuracy on a global basis. And then obviously the last step to say it again is using federated learning techniques to improve the accuracy uh, while preserving privacy. So those are three examples uh, of uh, edge cloud applications. I gonna just kind of wrap this up and answer any more questions. So just in summary, um, you know, this has been our mission. Uh, we, we hope you're eager to join us on this mission to enable a new generation of applications based on access to data from all 500 children's hospitals in the world. Uh, we've developed the infrastructure for doing this, uh, the so-called edge cloud services. And our real next step is starting to encourage both the uh, academic community as well as the commercial community to start building applications on top of this infrastructure. So my asks are really threefold. Would you like to be a Vanguard hospital? Uh, th this is really a matter of establishing the edge zone, which we need to engage with network engineering, security, et cetera, and test the edge zone with clinical engineering. The amount of effort here is measured in a couple of hours uh, because we've been through a lot of this already. So we're eager to, uh, talk to, to the technical community to go through all the details of this, but the actual establishment of an edge zone is probably, I'll say, a couple of hours worth of effort. <laughs> um, number two, are you interested in learning more about the edge cloud applications? I told you a little bit about Teleray, Umnitsa, and Econet Peds. There's also work going on with a company called Glendor and Dyad Medical. Um, and there's actually some video on this that I can share with people to tell them a little bit more about all these applications. And the last one is, uh, and this is unique to you guys, uh, my guess is you have AI applications which have been developed uh, in different domains on small data sets. Um, and do you have ones that you'd like to begin to test globally and improve using um, our uh, edge cloud technology? So that's my uh, presentation and my ask. And Tim, glad Tim, to answer was, any questions. Tim, that was fantastic. Did you, that you had showed us before that one little picture of what it looked like, you know, just the visual. I don't know if people need to see that or. Oh, I, 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 I <laughs> it just was but less, so less, small. Less. Yeah. It but was Kathy like jumped. made it real. It's just this very small little, it almost looks like a Holter monitor stuck on the machine. Yeah. yeah. It, it's uh, the size of your hand. Yeah. Basically. And we're actually working on ones that are uh, the size of like, you know, a, a half dollar. <laughs> so yeah. You could back, you, those of you in tech know this, but you could pack a lot of technology into very small spaces. The small instance we have running right now is running a four core 1.8 gigahertz microprocessor with uh, four gig of RAM and 32 gig of, of storage. So, and that's the small instance. So they're, they're very, we use the word server and I know people think that means the big 19 inch rack mount stuff, but it, it isn't. Thanks for bringing that up, Kathy. Can I quickly say three things? Uh, one, fantastic presentation. Lots of questions for me uh, from the. Uh, it's uh, it's very um, 
uh, inspirational. At the same time, I having done some of this work, one of the things is the legal aspects of it. When you have federated learning for rare diseases, rare uh, imaging findings of diseases and trying to find new diseases, one of the things is we find is try to get hospitals like Great Ormond Street or Stanford and us to agree on how data is shared. Uh, that's number one, uh, who owns the data, where the data goes. Those have taken the longest time. The two hours you mentioned is absolutely true. I could probably send it something in two hours as well. It takes about two years to get through the legal process. So that I think is number one, challenge number one. And number two is the infrastructure that you mentioned is, um, do you own it? And how do you control that data that goes to the federated cloud? What happens to it? That seems to be another bone of contention among the legal personnel. Um, and thirdly, is we have AI applications that are developed, and when we try to get it across another area, say for example, Kenya is a good example, right? The standard of data, this acquisition is different. So it obviously needs a more refinement to deploy in different areas. So utopian scenario is yet deployed to another place, it works fine, but it might need some kind of refinement. Who does that and how do you help with it? Okay, boy, that was a lot of different questions. Let me, let me start at the top uh, so you because you mentioned legal so uh, and, and let's just use Econet Peds as an example of this um, or and I can use Teleray as another example so um, the the first statement is you and we'll make it about Boston Boston has to choose to allow the Econet Peds application to run on the edge server connected to the ultrasound on the third floor so that has, you have to say yes or no to that, right? Okay, so if you say yes, I'm willing to share, then the data is shared locally on the third floor with the Econet PEDS application. Now, the next question you would wanna ask is, well, what's the Econet PEDS application gonna do with that data, right? So uh, the answer in the generation one is, it's going to analyze the data and present you an ejection fraction result, okay? That's all it's gonna do. Is that okay with, is, is that okay, right? Becomes, and, and that's an application question, right? Okay. And then the next step, which is, okay, we wanna do federated learning. Econet Peds wants to do federated learning. Dyad Medical wants to do federated learning. Well, you would ask them to go, well, what are you gonna do with the data? And the answer generically will be, oh, we are gonna take model parameters and transmit it to Azure or transmit it to a private cloud at you know, uh, Mayo Clinic or whatever, right? And to your point, the legal folks are gonna to have to be okay with that. Security is gonna ask the questions, well, I don't really trust Mayo Clinic. Okay, right? But again, that's an application question that you have to answer. Now, what we obviously are trying to do is make it secure and private relative to the data coming off of, we'll call it any machine in the world, any, any ultrasound, any MRI, any blood analyzer. The next question of what are you gonna do with that data becomes an application question. Does that make sense? Okay, so now, Clearly, what we are attempting to do here is because, and you know, because you're talking about AI, because AI is always stymied by this, oh, you're going to aggregate all the data somewhere. That's why federated, we don't have to implement federated. The application could take the data and put it in AWS if everybody wanted to do that. That's clearly possible. But given the state of the art, which we're, you may guess, we spend a lot of time talking to the Google and Facebook guys. So there's, a lot of imp, there's a lot of R and D work that's gone into how can I do learning locally. We feel like by enabling that, then I can do learning for rheumatic fever in Kenya, in, on site without having to worry about both privacy as well as we all know. I mean, if I have to go spend all the money on the network side to transmit data, and that that could be prohibitive in some situations. So we think that Federate is going to give a whole huge leg up because to answer your question about who owns the data, I mean, you own the data relative to what do you want to do with it in an application. We're, we're trying to, remember I made the point 
application specific data sharing. So when you share the data on the third floor uh, uh, Boston Children's with the EchoNet Peds application, yeah, it's you know coming from Boston Children, but it's not like you're going, well, I'm sharing it for any purpose, right? It, it is for that purpose, for that application, for that machine. So we think this is a much finer grained approach as opposed to the kind of uh, where we're all going to put it somewhere and you know do good things with it. I think I, I was talking with Clarissa about Echonet Peds. And so in that example, we decide, let's say we decide to be a bevel zone. We get the twin of our you know, from the data from our echo machine, we get to still decide whether we want to run echo net peds on it, their algorithm, which they're about to deploy, but you know, their point is to deploy it on the edge. Um, however, we are not sending them our images. They're just going to test their algorithm on our data, but our data doesn't leave it the, the parameters, which it learns from it does end up going to the cloud or Stanford or wherever yeah. it is. And yeah. then hopefully they'll send us back in the federated learning uh, improved algorithm. And then we it gets pushed back into our site and then we do more um, local training. When I talk to her about your you know, the same concerns I, I share, you know, I sort of walk through all the different steps. Um, I think we still have access to our own data. And I agree, it's always a heavy lift if we have to start sharing data in the standard way with another center and the legal aspects of it. There are still probably legal aspects, but this seems to lower that barrier because we're not really sharing their images and we're not really sharing, we're just sort of sharing coded image parameters that you uh, send up. Um, and then as a research application, you can decide like a collaborative or multi-center trial if you wanna work with somebody or not. And we can decide how much we want to be part of their research and what sort of academic currency, you know, for us participating in their algorithm. But I think the power is if we had any algorithms, we could use this infrastructure to deploy to other centers and probably we have more algorithms, I hope. Um, Amen. And then we could test it and Bevel Cloud just, as I understand, Tim, is that right? Just allows the infrastructure for us to do some of the federated learning, but we decide who we wanna learn with, what we wanna release, who we wanna work with and everything else. Is that is that right? Yeah, well, so let's just- we want on it. Yeah, let's reverse it. Let's call it the Ming application developed at Boston Children's. <laughs> so the, the, we can make the Ming application available in this model of the world to all 500 children's hospitals. Now they can say, oh, yes, I want to participate in this or no. And, oh, I only want these two ultrasound machines to participate. I mean, it's that fine grain, right? So we only have a couple minutes left. So we're talking mostly about research applications. I just wanna leave it open for uh, some of the other applications. Um, I think people are really understanding what you're saying, Tim, um, which is you're setting up a fundamental infrastructure. Obviously the utilization will depend on apps that get built. We think there could be many um, for apps that already exist there's some process there, you know, in order to, to choose to participate with these companies that developed them, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so, um, yeah, it's really pretty exciting in terms of any data sharing or research, if we need IRB approval or human subjects protection, we need it. <laughs> if we don't, we don't. <laughs> and it's not any different than it is now. Um, do, does anyone else want to ask? Um, other questions? So kind of a Tim, from the business model perspective from your end, are you, are you more interested in, in, in basically selling the infrastructure and globally uh, putting it in place or, or the data, accessing the data and, and doing aggregation from your, your end? No, so we, we're not trying to monetize data. Just 
say it straight off. We're not, it's your data. I'm, I'm not trying to do anything with it other than make it <laughs> so that people could build stuff. Our business model is identical to AWS fundamentally. We are compute, storage, networking, and, and services. If you want to think about it, it's roughly the pricing of a reserved instance in AWS world. So it's, it is infrastructure pricing. That's it. So you sell us, so you sell us and we could, you know, potentially go like domain by domain and we just want to start with cardiology data or, or, or you kind of more globally it's, populated. It, it, it's really to think about it, it's, it's machine by machine. It's machine, machine by machine. So you can yeah. start with a single machine, buy it <laughs> and then play with it. Well, in fact, Actually, what, yeah. yeah, in, in deploying the edge zone, we do a test. We ask people to pick an ultrasound because mm -hmm. we actually test the whole flow off of a single ultrasound. So yeah, it can be one machine. And Is Tim, there... right now to be the Vanguard Center, um, there's still some of this that we can, we can do for free, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we said we would deploy the edge zone uh, and get it up and show you all no charge for the Vanguard hospitals. On one so machine. we've limited this to about 80 hospitals. So just FYI. So. And you have how many, you know, sorry. <laughs> we're, we're very close to the number. <laughs> but, but, but for example, chocolate yeah, story. Yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. So Tim, is there, yeah. someone, is there someone we could talk to at CHOP about how they're using it? Uh, no, I, I mean, at where? CHOP. At, you, you want to talk to Anthony? Mm -hmm. No, no. Oh, sorry. No, not chalk. Chop. Children's chalk. Hospital. I, I didn't Hospital say. I didn't yeah. say chop. Oh. oh, it was on your. I'm slide. very deliberate. You may not have noticed this, but I deliberately do not actually tell you what hospitals. Mm -hmm. I told you things I, like geography. I, I thought I, I said saw it on your slide. It, 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 yeah, that's just showing you there's a lot of children's hospitals in the world. Okay. I think it was actually chalk, but chalk was on. Yeah, it as well. chalk. Chop we, is on your slide. That, that's why I thought it was. That's Chop, why I thought we, Chop is one of your customers. I thought I thought they were too Ken. So I, there must be some sensitivity of what what you know people in the network. We don't we don't say where we're deployed. I told you uh, that we are in Rome. We are in Philadelphia. <laughs> we are in Northern California, and we're in Southern California. <laughs> so. okay. And we're about to be in another location in the West Coast. So, but really what it is, is it's really talking you through what we're, I mean, we're getting ready to do another edge zone deployment, which we're glad to talk it through with you. Or if you want to talk to any of the people who've deployed an edge zone, we could have that conversation. But it's really, frankly, an IT conversation, which is, we're, we're glad to have. Because it goes back to the central question, which is what are you going to do with it, right? And obviously, because we did the meeting this morning, the invitation is out to be part of the EchoNet Peds project, right? So. Hey, Tim, I, thank you. Sorry, I have to jump off onto another call. We've got some internal discussion to go for. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, though. This is very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Peter. Peter. Thank you, Tim. Hey. Well, thanks, yeah. everybody. We'll, we'll regroup internally, Tim, obviously. Um, See, see how people yeah. um, feel if there's more questions and um, Can I, I request, really appreciate it, yeah. Can request some documents, uh, like, like legal documents, et cetera, for sharing, because that's what I think is the, the thing that we need to discuss on our end as well. So if you have anything that we can read and like get some background on, some deeper reading um, as to how the thing is stored and also how an edge cloud is deployed and what we need to do as next steps for us, that might make, help us uh, hold a discussion going forward internally as well. Yeah, we can do that. I mean, some of our stuff is really meant for uh, people with software experience. So if you're ready for that, we can- So, so Tim, Tim, fundamentally, right? Like I, I assume you're not poking holes in our firewall, right? The client connects to your servers, right? So this is all client initiated. Yeah, you, don't, and, you don't have to you don't have to open the ports on because that, that's always we, something that will take us a no, year. We, because if you're going to go communicate with a Azure application externally, you have to come through a port. So we tell network engineering we are coming through port 443 
We have a managed VPN at the other end. There's actually a whitelist process between the uh, edge application and the destination IP address. So it's a very okay. managed. We actually even tell network engineering to put all of the edge servers on a VLAN so that they can manage it as a single thing if they feel like there's a problem to shut it down altogether, et cetera. So we have a series of things that we walk through network engineering, which are really about management and control of, of it. So yeah. And wh where's the data? Where's the, cause 32 gigabytes is not that much, right? Like you, you'll, you'll saturate it. Do you eventually did like recycle that storage or where, yeah. where do you so accumulate we, the data? We, yeah, so the, the digital twin basically, to your point, to make up something. I mean, if you're doing an ultrasound every five minutes, then yeah, it's going to run through the 32 gig and then round robin get rid of the last image. So it'll be up to the application to make a decision about what does it want to do with it? Does it want to send it into long-term storage? Does it want to compute on it? Yeah. Oh, I see. So, so you can connect it with potentially AWS and basically buffer the data to the cloud? Oh, in fact, just you use Teleray as an example. That's exactly, it's taking the image and putting it in, in this case, in Azure, an application is doing that for long-term archival storage. Yeah. Or, or you guys could write an application that did that as well if you wanted to, right? So yeah. The, there is finite storage at the edge server. If you if you speak tech talk, we're actually headed to making the interface at the edge be an S3 interface. So okay. I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is really interesting to think about what that will mean. But yeah, to your point, you will have to, uh, you know, you, you can't think of our edge server as long-term storage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kathy, I'll just say to everybody, if anybody has questions, I think that you all have my email because mm -hmm. uh, I, we're happy to talk more. You want to go yeah. deeper in any area. Uh, you know, I was light on how all the IT stuff works. We can right. take you through the entire provisioning process of an edge yeah. zone. I mean, the entire sequence, all, all the above. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot. I know we're yeah. out of time and we lost, we lost half our people. So, you know, I, I really appreciate everyone's time and Tim, uh, telling us with such a wide audience that we brought with tech, <laughs> different degrees of tech backgrounds and research backgrounds, you know, just to, you, you did a fantastic job of making it as accessible as you could as a first step towards yes. us understanding it enough, uh, to decide. Uh, what yes. children might want to do with it. So yep. I really appreciate that. So. Well, th thank you all for taking the